Good streaming. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Disability Voices United, SDP Connect. My name is Christiana Morales. I'm the director here of the Self-Determination Program at Disability Voices United. With us also is Judy Mark, our president and fearless leader. Um, we have a great panel of independent facilitators here today, but before we get started, I do have some announcements, and there were some directives that came out we wanted to talk about really quickly. Um, so the first directive, I'm going to share my screen here. I'm actually excited about this directive, which tells you what a nerd I am, that I get excited about directives. So um, this was a directive that really initially started with um, North Los Angeles Regional Center around the 099, the independent facilitators. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to learn about it in just a couple minutes here. Um, had said that the independent facilitators had to do everything in person. And so there was a question about remote uh, services. And so the local volunteer advisory committee did a great job of advocacy and really getting out there and- and uh, Slow down, sorry, slow down. Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, got out there and advocated and DDS responded and came up with this great directive that not only said that the 099, the independent facilitators could work remotely, but other services could as well. And so you may have had, I've, I've heard a lot of stories of financial management services and regional centers that would say all the services had to be in California. So even if it was remote, you couldn't get it. Well, this directive says, if you meet these requirements, if the participant meets these requirements and the participant is in California, the vendor can be outside of California. So this was a really exciting one for us. That means if you had a computer class or an art class that you were taking during COVID that you wanted to continue take, you can now take it. So yay, if, if you have any issues with people with a financial management service or regional center saying, no, you can't do it, this is the directive you want to go to. And again, we'll put all the directives and everything in the chat. So take a good look. You know what I forgot? I got all excited and started and forgot to remind everybody that we have interpretation. I apologize to our interpreters. We have amazing interpreters who are here with us today. We do it in both Spanish and Korean. Please go down to the bottom of your screen, select the globe, and select your language. Even if you speak English, select your language. So if we have an interpretation, um, uh, a question in another language, you'll hear it in English. If you're on a cell phone, go to the three dots at the bottom of your phone, push those, and then you will see the options for interpretation. Come back. See, I got too excited about this directive. Okay. <laughs> now we'll go to our second directive that came out. This directed wet directive is about coordinated family support services. Now, initially they came out and talked about this new service that was coming out and that it would be available to everybody. And then a directive came out and said, people in self-determination program could not get it. Now this directive says, people in self-determination program can get coordinated family support services, but it's gonna be held outside of the budget. And so that would be kind of similar to a paid internship program, or if you have assistance with um, uh, co-pays, those are things that are held outside of the budget. If you're not familiar with what coordinated family support services are, um, it's kind of coming into focus what it's actually gonna look like, but the idea, the general idea was that participants who lived outside of their family home, would have supported living services. And that would help them with their grocery shopping and getting to doctor's appointments and scheduling their, their staff and all kinds of things like that. If they moved home, they would lose that service. They would lose supported living services because you couldn't have it in the home, which was a problem if their whoever they were living with, their family member was elderly or there was a reason they couldn't do those things for that person. So this was kind of the idea that for people who are living in a family home can still get those supports. So what it's looking like with who is vendorizing for this service currently, they it looks like it's a lot of the supported living service providers are, are kind of doing it, but it's still, there isn't one way I'm seeing any of the regional centers do it. So it, it, it's still a work in progress, but 
it is available to people in the self-determination program now. So that's also good news. Um, the last directive that came out, it was updating the goods and services one. Um, if you've heard us speak about how you determine if you're allowed to put something in your spending plan, you've heard us talk about this directive all the time. It has the chart and the list of things that you can uh, that you can and cannot put in your spending plan. Um, so they updated it. But when we looked at it, I went through it all. It looks like the only thing they really updated it, it was... In enclosure B, they did just add the coordinated family support services can now are can be allowed. So there wasn't any other major update to that uh, goods and services. The and oh, I have one more coming up in January 10th, which is our next SDP Connect. We are not going to have one. Um, in two weeks because we're taking a holiday. And um, so this is our last one of the year, which is really kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's it's already the end of the year. Um, so our January 10th, we're actually gonna be going into complete detail talking about this subject, but I thought in the meantime, I'm getting so many questions about it. I give you the information. Um, so the direct support, the direct service provider training stipend. DSP training stipend. It is money for your employees. If you are in co-employer or sole employer, if they work more than 10 hours, there's some other rules you're going to want to work through, read through to make sure that they qualify. They can get paid $625 to take a class. They can take up to two classes, which is, a, I think it's a good amount of money. One of the main classes that they, the what first class they have to take is one on ethics. And I took the class, thought it was so great. In January, the person who trains the class, does, created the training is going to come and speak with us. So we're going to be able to talk to him. We're going to talk about how to get your employees paid. There's a lot of confusion with the FMSs and the regional centers right now. We're trying to figure out how everybody's going to get paid for this. But keep it in mind and do take a look at this. Um, we will put this link because it's kind of hard to find on the DDS website. So we will put the link to this in the chat for you as well. The very last thing we have is DBU with ICC is doing a toy giveaway for Christmas. And we're with it's in partnership with Toys for Tots and we're so excited. So it is December 17th. It's going to be in the parking lot of Tierra del Sol, and it's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We will put the flyer and, oh, we're going to put the registration in the chat. So if you want to register, you can go. We have another site. Judy, were you able to? Get, oh, Judy's got the other link. Let me stop oh, sharing so you can. There you um, so there's two toy giveaways. They're both in Southern California. We're sorry. And this is a an event that we're co-sponsoring with the Integrated Community Collaborative. Um, this is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their siblings, okay? So it's not just for the, the child who receives services from Regional Center. Please download this flyer. I'll get the next flyer into the chat as well, but let me share you we're doing one in LA County and one in, this is in Huntington Park in Orange County. Um, and this one is on Wednesday, December 20th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's at a church in Huntington Park. And we have the flyers in both English and in Spanish. Um, last year we did this even if you don't need toys, we urge you to come. If you're looking for a pick-me-up to make you happy, I urge you to come. Because it literally, it made my heart sing for a full couple of weeks after, after we had it. So I encourage you to come. If you want to come, just let us know and we could use the volunteers. Um, at the event, we're literally giving away thousands of toys at these two events. So, um, but it is specifically for the intellectual and developmental disability community and their siblings. So I will stop sharing that. And then before we start, there was a question in the chat that somebody had asking, oh, Huntington Park. Oh, it's Huntington Park, not Huntington Beach. You're right. Huntington Park is LA County. It's not Huntington Beach, which is in Orange County. I apologize. 
So um, Huntington Park is actually near Downey and right off the five freeway. So hopefully that will be great for folks if they can drive out from uh, Orange County as well. Somebody asked in the chat though, first of all, can you hear me okay, Christiana? Okay. Um, somebody asked in the chat what the difference is between um, coordinated family support services and independent living services. They're very different. Um, independent living services is helping, is direct support for that. The, the, it could be a young adult, could be a teenager or a, a, an adult who needs to build those kinds of skills that you would have to be, um, to, to take responsibility of your own life in your own home. You don't have to live outside the home to outside the family home to, to receive ILS services. But if you do move out, you can also receive ILS services. Um, the coordinated family supports is a specific type of support service for adults who still live with their parents. And originally when the direct, when a directive came out in April, they, they said that nobody in the self-determination program could get access to coordinated family supports, literally the entire class of people. Um, and so I took uh, my regional center and DDS to fair hearing over this. This is a, a support system that is very critical. It helps um, it helps you find staff to be in your home. It helps to be in your parents' home. It helps you um, coordinate any other activities. They help you get generic resources. So they may be able to help you fight, you know, SSI or SSI or Department of Rehabilitation. Um, and um, and I, I will not give you the gory details of the, the case, um, but ultimately, it did spur this um, directive, which says that you can get coordinated family support services outside of your STP budget. So that's a service you get in addition to all those STP services you get. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that somebody will take advantage of it. I'm trying to right now, um, but I will send it back to you, Christiana. So um, I want to introduce, we're going to have an independent facilitator roundtable, which I'm so excited about. So I want to start by introducing our independent facilitators. And we have IFs, and, and I'm going to use the acronym IF because saying the word independent facilitator five million times is going to be difficult during this conversation um, from all over the state, which is very exciting. So um, we're going to start with Melissa Amster. She is an independent facilitator from Amster Law Firm. Hi, Melissa. Dustlin Beavers is an independent facilitator with First Choice Solutions. Natalie Cooper is an independent facilitator and inclusion advocate. And Katie Ramirez is an executive director and independent facilitator of Ally Comprehensive Services. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So the plan is, is I have a few questions we're going to ask in the round table, and then we're going to open it up to everybody else. And so um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. And when we get to um, the question and answer part, we can, we'll ask people to raise their hand and we alternate between the chat and the raised hands. So I think the first question is, which is on a lot of people's mind right now um, is, can you talk about the change that is scheduled to happen on January 1st, 2024 with independent facilitators? Specifically, how does this apply to participants? And I tagged Dustlin to, to answer this question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I will, um, I will give the factual information and then I may have to slip in my personal opinion. I apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, but right now, the way you've been able to get help um, transitioning into self-determination, you have two options that they call option A and option B. And so option A is the option we're most familiar with. That's where you have $2,500. You can pick um, just about anybody who's completed the IF course and the person center planning course to be essentially paid up to $2,500 to write your plan and hopefully carry through, carry you through the, the transition process. That individual did not need to be 
truly vendorized with the regional center. So they were able to get paid through what they call 024. And 024 means you don't have to have all these extra requirements. Um, you're not a traditional vendor. It's just a way for regional center to pay you for the services you provided. What this meant was that more people had more choices as to who they wanted to work with because you didn't have to select a vendor list that regional center provides you. Now, they then introduced option B. And so option B has been available. Um, I don't know how many people have been using it, but what option B offers is you have two parts. The first part is you can choose to have a person-centered plan written by a person-centered plan writer or an independent facilitator, and they can charge up to $1,000 for that plan. And the person who writes your plan, again, does not need to be a traditional regional center vendor. They can get paid through that 024 process, which means um, it, it's a lot less requirements for you to get paid. Now, after that plan is written, the help that you receive to get into self-determination under option B is now you need to work with somebody who is vendored and that vendored service code is 099. So you're gonna hear it described as a 099 provider. A 099 provider is somebody who went through the full vendorization process that their home regional center required. So because there's 21 different regional centers, there's been 21 different ways that people can become vendored under 099. So 099 will be the option that you're going to use in order to get help to get yourself into self-determination. So what that means now is the choices of support that you'll have will be either A, somebody who volunteers their time and it's free support, B, your regional center service coordinator or participant choice specialist who is your generic resource, or C, a 099 vendor off the regional center list who can help you get through the process. Now, 099 is something that um, is limited to a, a total of 40 hours. So right now you have up to 40 hours of 099 support to help you get through the self-determination transition process. So that 40 hours can be shared with the FMS. So that's something you'll have to work with your service coordinator, your FMS, and your 099 provider to decide how you're going to split those hours. So come January, it, it will change the landscape. It changes your options of who you can select to help you transition if the people that you're selecting need to be paid for their services to help you transition. Um, my, my challenge is I'm personally not vendored under 099 yet. Um, <clears throat> and I think this will be kind of a, a, something to, to be aware of is that the process is not the same at each regional center and the requirements can be greater. Um, for example, the insurance requirements, right. For these providers it is something that's being required along with all these other um, boxes you have to check off. So my concern as an independent facilitator is that your, your options for support will be limited. And I worry that the individuals who selected to, or maybe organizations who chose the 099 vendorization may not have the experience to support the volume of transitions that are going to be potentially happening in this next year. So, uh, you know, it's an IF roundtable. I'm going to <laughs> throw it out there for you. Well, 
and, and maybe the fellow IFs can uh, know the answer to this, but I, I'm still unclear if every client after they do the thousand dollars for the PCP, who, who decides and authorizes that they can use the 099 or do they get to decide, oh, you have a smaller budget and I'm a service coordinator. I, I can do your budget and not authorize 099. So does yeah. anyone know? I mean, are you, as a consumer, are you guaranteed access to 099? It's a great question. I mean, I, I think that it's a, it's an IPP request. It's an IPP service request. Um, and if they're going to deny you access, then I think you can certainly exercise your rights to take it through the, the notice of action process. I mean, Natalie, it's a great question. We don't really have clarity if this is something you're, you're guaranteed access to or if you're going to have to present your argument as to why you need this service. I'm not sure. I don't know. Katie, Melissa, have you guys? I, I agree. I believe that it is going to be something that needs to be authorized by the service coordinator and put in a purchase of service um, like, like a traditional service. Yeah. My and, work. And, and, okay. and I, and, and just sorry, and I would caution any IAPs or even the families to make sure that purchase of service has been authorized prior to doing any work under 099. Um, and, you know, with everything, hopefully that won't be a barrier to any um, clients with starting services. Mm -hmm. So I do want to emphasize that if you are currently in the self-determination program, None of this is going to impact you. This is really for the people who are transitioning in now. So, or are transitioning in in the future. So um, I don't, if you're in it now, I don't want you to be worrying about this. If you are interviewing or looking for people, this you need to be aware of it because you would need to ask the people if they are vendored 099 for your regional center, if you intend to use them, which mm -hmm. kind of leads to our next question, which was, what should a participant look for or ask when they're hiring a person-centered planner, self-directed support, independent facilitator? So I use those three terms now because the DDS kind of broke it up. We used to refer to all those positions as independent facilitator, and now they kind of have three different titles. So Melissa, do you have um, some suggestions of things that people might want to ask? Sure. Um... So, and, and obviously for each of those positions, it could be a different questions, but I'll just, I'll, I'll combine them. And then we, if we need to separate them, I can also do that. But I would say the overall knowledge of working with in self-determination, and then the overall knowledge of working with your regional center. I know people have come to me from different regional centers that I am just not as familiar with. And I always, provide a lot of caution when working with a regional center that that I'm not familiar with. You know, I say I'm, I'm very knowledgeable about self-determination, but I'm not knowledgeable working with your regional center. And, and I think that that is definitely, um, you know, something that you need to be think about. Um, I would want to also know how many clients that the, that they have transitioned into self-determination. I'd like to know their availability. And I don't know, depending on how you put this on your list, this might be one, this might be five, but how much you like working with that person? Um, because you're going to spend a lot of time with that person. <laughs> and, and if you don't like them as a person or don't like spending lots of Zoom meetings with them, then I don't think it would be a good fit. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind. And I guess just maybe one last thing when we're talking about the different positions. Um, in my mind, um, as an independent facilitator or someone that has transferred a number of clients, um, for me, it is not so helpful when people come to me with a person center plan already written. Um, really, for me, as someone that provides those transition services and ongoing services, doing the person center planning is very helpful for me personally. I get to know the client, I get to know the client's family, I get to know the client's wishes and 
and and such. And that really helps me advocate in the IPP process and the whole and 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 also just with everything. So if someone comes with me with a person center plan already written it is not so helpful. So um, in my mind, I would sort of set up the, who that person is going to help you um, with the self-directed support or the independent facilitator to move you into self-determination and if and then move on to hiring the person center plan. Those are all great points. Does anybody else have ones they want to add? If I could add, uh, Christiana, um, I agree with Melissa with a lot of what she said with, you know, uh, really determining the level, level of expertise the individual has, um, you know, their knowledge on working with your specific regional center. I think it's also important to know preferred languages, right? If there's a preferred language, what's their capacity for that? Are they fluent um, and able to support? Uh, sometimes we have individuals that need a specific language or the individual themselves may speak English, but their circle of support has another language requirement. So that's really important. Um, also, I think it's really important for individuals to identify what level of support they may need. They may have a really specific um, area that they need most help in. And that's important to identify in advance so that those questions can be asked of the independent facilitator or person center planner, or whoever's gonna help them to really make sure it's the right fit um, for them and the facilitator and, and person center planner or, or uh, support. Um, just because there could be those limitations and I think um, those individuals should know what those limitations are. Like, hey, I'm not really well versed with maybe um, an SLS type program, or maybe I'm better versed with um, younger age individuals than adults or transition age. So those are important things to really keep in mind when identifying and interviewing. I want to add, um, so so ditto to both Melissa and Katie. <laughs> And then I'm going to add another piece. Um, I think it's really important that you find out what that IF's work style is and what your expectations are. So if your expectations are that a plan shouldn't take somebody more than two days to write and you hire somebody that likes to, to work through the process for a couple of meetings, you're going to be annoyed that this person hasn't written your plan in two days. Or vice versa, if somebody is is maybe a really quick plan writer, one meeting, they feel like they've done the work, but you want a more thorough job, you know, you want to make sure that your expectations are matched up with the work style of the person that you're you're going to select to help you. The other is to make sure you understand what their communication style is. Um, if you're somebody who really wants uh, someone available that like same day level service. Um, I think that's something you need to find out if your IF can provide you same day level service. Um, that's not realistic for someone like myself with a family and dogs and <laughs> all kinds of things, you know, I may not be able to, to immediately answer your text. Right. And so I may not be your pick because I may not be able to return your text within 10 minutes. And if that's important to you, that's okay. Just make sure you get yourself matched up with somebody um, who who is a is a good fit for what your communication style and expectations are. Um, and and I concur with everybody else. I just want to reinforce how important it is to make sure that if you're going to transition, really think about how that plan is going to work for you to support you in that transition. And I've had the same challenges where when we have not written the plan, it it's very difficult sometimes to then move forward without having to go back and rewrite the plan. Like I want to agree with what everyone said. Um, I am someone who is a visual learner, so I always like to um have the discussion about what's your scope of service, but also do you have a written contract or uh, that I can review so that 
both of us are clear again. Um, I find it helpful. My IF has like responsibilities for the client, which would be me and then their responsibilities and it, and it has communication styles. Like I will respond within 48 hours or, um, those things. Uh, also if, especially now with 099, are you vendored with my regional center? Um, and then I would like to know, um, what, how long have you been an IF or a person centered planner just, and, and what brought you to this field? Um, just to try to make that personal connection for me is important with, um, the people we're working with. Um, and then if, if the IF or a, even the person center plan writer um, provides ongoing services because you'll need an updated PCP for the next year. Um, and what, how many hours do they require or think anticipate that to be so that I can plan accordingly in my budget for that? Um, so I, I think that helps start the relationship. Like, is it going to be long-term or short-term kind of thing? <laughs> Um, and can I afford you? I mean, um, because budgets come in all different sizes and, and so I want to just be upfront and, and have that clear communication from the get go from both sides. Like what, as a client, am I required to do? And as a provider, am I, um, holding standards? I agree with all of you. Uh, the only thing that I would add is, and that's because I'm from DVU. <laughs> Um, the first thing is I want to know that they believe in the principles of self-determination and that they understand the principles and that um, this self-determination is about the participant and their wants and their needs and that they they are not medical model, that they really believe in the, the philosophy of self-determination to me is a very, very important piece to picking an independent facilitator. Um, and I know that we have a very large shortage right now, and I'm part of the uh, self-determination, um, the orientation, and the first que the question we get constantly is, how do I find one? So, I, and I realize that there is a shortage, but I do think it's worth waiting for the right person. So don't just take somebody because they're available. You know, I think every single person on this panel talked about the importance of this kind of this relationship. This is going to be a relationship. This is going to be somebody who is going to be, you know, really helping the participant with their hopes and dreams. So you want it to be a good fit. So um, I do encourage finding that right person. Okay, my next question. Wait, before you go, Christiana, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I put this in the chat for you, but... I'm sorry. I, I didn't okay. See. I know it, there's a lot in the chat. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to um, look at our Think Outside the Box book. Um, we spent a lot of time working on it. And there is a section on hiring service providers. And we provide sample questions of that you can ask to, to inter, when you're interviewing independent facilitators, FMSs as well as um, you know, staff, personal staff that are supporting you. And so I encourage you, if you don't have the book, you, uh, Kira just put it in the chat. So um, I encourage you, if you already have the book, then look up that section. Awesome. Um, and you can buy our book on Amazon now, which is kind of exciting. Where And the Spanish version is coming soon, but the English version is on Amazon. So here's a big question, I think, and, and I, I posed it to all of you. What is the most common misconception about self-determination? Does it? Oh, does oh, it, uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't want to say it's the most common, but one that I, I, I need, we need to overcome. Yes, this is your budget and but you cannot it's not an open checkbook to like spend on how you want and if it's not in the spending plan and you went ahead and authorized that service or spent it that does not mean you're getting reimbursed for it. So use your spending plan and and stick to your budget. Like this 
I, <laughs> again, we should teach budgeting in high school. Uh, but this is like any other financial uh, checkbook that you have to keep. Like you have to keep it balanced. Your your independent facilitator might help you with that um, if that's in their scope. But um, it's you can't just buy what you want or get you know take a class because you feel like it. <laughs> Right. It, There's it, a process, right? <laughs> it, Self-determination is not intended to be a shopping list um, kind of thing. Yeah, it that, that's a challenge. I think another one is that if you don't get a perfect budget, you will never be able to go back and make adjustments. It's exactly. like this concept that it has to be one and you've got one shot at it to make it really good and perfect. What I want to share is um, a, an okay budget that meets your needs is a good starting point. It does not have to be perfect. Um, and don't feel like you need to compare it to others. It's really individualized to you. And if things change along the way, that's okay. It can change with you. So don't, uh, there's this idea that everything has to be just so, it has to be perfect or I'm going to lose out on my opportunity to make it right. And that's just, that's a myth. <laughs> um, I would say that, um, that if you found regional center difficult to work with before you went to, into self-determination, regional center still, and your service coordinator are still a very big part of your life. And it will continue to, they will continue serving you in self-determination. So if they're slow responding to emails before self-determination, they're gonna be slow responding to um, updates in your budget or something like that. So Regional Center does not get out of your life in self-determination. <laughs> no, they do not. <laughs> and if I can add some of the misconceptions that I see still very frequently is the idea that the budget is solely based on the last 12 months that was used. So there's still many individuals that think that because they had no services or zero budget to nearly no budget, that there's really no point in them entering self-determination when honestly, it's the exact opposite. This is really such a great program and tool um, when we're talking about in, individuals that are um, using services the least or don't have a lot of options in their areas, um, this is this is perfect because most of the time what we find is if you have zero to no budget, it just means that you have a lot of needs that are not met. Um, and through this process and using the principles and being person-centered, you're really able to identify those supports and services that are needed to work towards adding to the budget and then really being able to tailor that to work for, for the individual. So that's still something I really see. And another one I would just mention is a lot of times I hear, and I think sometimes it goes hand in hand that it's geared more towards adults than children, um, but that really, really isn't the case. Uh, so uh, just wanna just wanna throw those out there. Well, you guys are good. You made it hard uh, for to me to go last. So mine is that um, the misconception that you don't have to still use generic resources first. So you will all. This is still federal money. You still have the same rules as the traditional system. So um, we talk about freedom, but I, I like to say freedom within boundaries. So you are going to have those same rules around. Um, so I think that's a common misconception. Um, okay, our next question. What advice do you have for those that are interested in transitioning to the self-determination program? Katie. So... I have a lot of advice, but I'll leave plenty for the rest of the panelists. Um, I think first and foremost is really uh, doing kind of what you're doing now, being involved in, in meetings like this and other trainings and gathering that information so that you can really make an informed decision, make sure that it, the program's right 
for you, which my mine, it's right for everyone. Um, but really making that decision for yourself, um, having patience, uh, because it's an incredible program, but it can take some time uh, to get through the various steps and and get in and really benefit from the, the, the fruits of what comes once you go through these steps. Um, I like to think that sometimes to go fast, you have to go slow. And really, when you really take these steps and take it, you know, step by step to to really identify those 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 goals, those hopes and dreams, and the support, uh, it it really becomes much easier in the future. Uh, so having that patience, I think, is really key. Um, and just like I said, connecting with groups like this and other support groups. Also, there's uh, the local advisory committees, right, that each regional center has, and they really do provide additional supports with implementation funding. So it's important to look at your local regional center and see what they're doing to, to help and support you through this process. Um, but those are some of the things that, that uh, some of my advice, I have a lot more, but I'll open it up to the rest of the panelists. I would just second the importance of, of patience. Um, every transition that, that we've supported that became really difficult was because of this urgency to get transitioned right away. And it's tough because there's different pieces that we can't control. We can't control the FMS and how quick the FMS can start. We can't control how quick the regional center will get through whatever it is the regional center needs to do at that point in the transition. There's a lot of things that um, kind of can sneak up in the process that can slow down your expected or anticipated timeline. And I think that if you can go into it with the idea of we're going to chug along and when it's ready, it's ready. And that's the right time to start. And, you know, it, I know that that isn't necessarily how it can always be because we have helped people in emergency circumstances. Um, and I think that's a little different, but if you have the ability to, um, to really just make sure the pieces are in place and you get a start date that, that eventually works, you will be a lot less stressed. The people that I find that become the most stressed in this process set a, a, a two month timeline in their head of when, they, when they're going to start. And when we don't meet that two month timeline for all those reasons we can't control, it becomes really stressful because I think you start planning for what you want to see happen when you're in self-determination. And it's hard because if we can't meet that deadline and you've already made plans and we're not able to support those plans, then it adds another layer of disappointment and stress. And so I would say, I would caution you making plans until you get the start date, <laughs> um, just because we can't really predict an, an actual, um, actual start date when we're getting going in the beginning. I want to add that the, to me, I can't express the importance of the person-centered plan. Like, don't rush through this. This isn't just a, a checkbox. This is the foundation of your entire program. So take the time, have somebody else come and help you, have an expert come and help you and do it correctly. Um, it's, it's, I, it's so key to everything that I, that's, that's my piece. Uh, Melissa, did you want to? Oh, I was going to say, I really like the patience. Um, and what I tell prospective clients that you, that generally it takes between six and nine months. Um, obviously there's outliers on either end and it probably takes about 20 to 25 hours of time. Um, to get into self-determination. So I try to have that conversation at the beginning so we understand expectations. 
Um, and then for me, something that's helpful for me to know is how the client would like to spend the money um, when they are in self-determination, right? That helps me when planning, putting together the PCP and um, also just having those expectations, right? If, if you, you know, and making sure that some of those things aren't generic resources. So how, how that would be sort of my, on top of everything, how you want to spend the money in self-determination. And maybe uh, if there are services that they are going to require, they can ask for them early um, and get the assessments done if they're going to be assessments required or whatever, while you're waiting for your independent facilitator, or your person center plan, you can get some of those things going. Okay, so can you talk about what participants might expect in their first year? Um, Natalie. Yes. Uh well, it, it's a new system for you to learn, right? So we're all part of like systems. Um, and so there's a learning curve, but it's amazing. <laughs> so, um, but you're, you get this whole, pl your person centered plan and it's amazing. And you have these goals and um, what you want to accomplish for the year. But just remember, you don't need to accomplish that all in the first three months. Be kind to yourself get the key pieces like um, maybe hiring and finding staff, I know is something that I hear constantly from a lot of clients and, and you know, finally having the choice and control over how much you're paying your staff and um, that you don't have to use a vendor for those staff members. Um, so pick, pick something that's super important and work on that first. Um, and then you are learning how to work with your FMS and what's required. Um, you know, when you, if you have a purchase on your spending plan that's approved, there's processes to do that. Like if you're under 18, a parent can't go out and purchase that and be reimbursed. Um, if, or maybe in your FMS, you can't be in reimbursed at all. And there's a form you need to fill out. And then they make purchases on the third Thursday of the month. So you want to make sure to have your paperwork. So um, there, there's a lot of learning, but it's not, the work I think is worth it because the outcome is your hopes, dreams, and goals. And so you are really driving it and all the work you're putting in is getting your hopes and dreams to come to fruition, not, not fitting you into a box. Um, I think that's totally, yeah. um, Tim has his hand up. I have a question for the panelists. For those independent facilitators who works with older adults who doesn't want their family's members involved in the SDP, how to do help them build out their natural support in order to have meaningful outcomes with their goals in their PCP, besides hiring staff and purchasing services? I'm always asked the best question. <laughs> who, who wants to take that one? So I, I would say primarily I, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's usually the, the group that I, that I work with best. That's the group I enjoy um, supporting. And, and I think your independent facilitator can really be um, a good advocate or a good support to help, help you get to that spot where family isn't running your life helping you get to a place where you're, you're building up supports outside of your family, helping you um, make those connections, being somebody to troubleshoot off of, figure out what the, what, what direction you personally want to go, you know, what direction you want to go, not what your family's telling you, you should do. Um, and just helping you build your confidence if you need that in making decisions that work for you. Um, it's very person-centered and you're, if, if that's what you're looking for, find an IF who can help support that. Find an IF who will communicate with you instead of your parents. Find an IF who will ask you first, um, look to you for direction. And I think that will really set the tone for putting you at the center of directing your life. 
Did I answer the question or did I make something else up? <laughs> I think too that, you know, for parents, our biggest concern is what happens when we're gone. Mm. And what happens when we're gone is, is our loved ones take over. And so let's have, let's make sure they are set up and ready to take over. Um, and so I think it's, it's really, really important that we, they do have the supports and the natural supports. Well, and, and in addition to that, um, a, a good IF should be able to help the parents build their confidence in letting go. Yeah. That's a big part of it, right? So we have the the person-centered focus, but it's also reassuring the, the family members who very much care and don't want to see, you know, they don't want to see anything bad happen, right? Um, helping them build the confidence that, you know what, I can go on vacation because this is, squared away, or um, I can take a step back now and let my loved one be the advocate, show up at the meeting, sign those documents. And so I think it's kind of, it's a shift on both sides and just helping both sides get there. It's not a quick process, right? You don't come in and just cut the strings and go, okay, new start. Um, I think it's, it, you know, if you can gently start building confidence on both sides and helping people feel good about where their loved one's at and the progress and that they're going in the direction they're moving in. I think, Melissa, did you want to add? Uh, oh, I would just, if I understood the question correctly, I think that um, an IF with client um, permission could be a really good conduit to um, conversations and really allowing those conversations to take place um, between all of the circles. I remember when I did my special education advocacy training, there was, we had a very long discussion about who the client was. And, and I think that's a really important thing to think about. And, and when you're hiring your independent facilitator, do they understand who the client is, is really important. Um, um, let's talk about what building your plan over time means. Um, and actually, I think we kind of hit on it a little bit as you were talking about year one, but Dusty, what do you? Yeah, and, and I think it also goes into um, maybe what to expect your first year. <clears throat> so it's pretty common for you to change your plan as the year goes on. What you expect will work out isn't always the way it is. And you learn to adjust or pivot and figure out what works for you. So really that, that person-centered plan, your self-determination spending plan, those are what I like to call, a li they're living documents. They live and breathe and grow with you. And that's the beauty about uh, self-determination is it gives you more flexibility to adjust it in real time to meet your needs. And it allows you to figure out what works and what doesn't work and, and hopefully pivot quick enough to where you can then start doing something that works better for you. So I think that's a, I think that's a big part. You know, again, it shapes and grows with you. And that's the cool thing about it. And if I can add to that, um, just exactly as Dusty is saying, um, when we're working with our individuals and really focusing on developing those really person-centered goals, uh, a lot of times we remind our families or individuals that um, this, this plan as Dusty said, is that living document. And they may think that, hey, I really am interested in learning how to play the guitar and then may take their first lesson or begin that session and realize, actually, it's not for me. I, I like music, but I don't want to learn how to play the guitar. And that's completely fine. Um, sometimes there's a lot of uh, difficulty with figuring out what activities they may be interested in, mainly because 
what I found is sometimes they haven't had the experience yet. And it's hard to know what you like and don't like if you haven't had the opportunities to make these choices and have these experiences. So I really like to remind individuals that it's, it's, it's a process. It's we're going off of what the individual really likes and what their desires are and interests are. And if they try it and they don't like it, that's okay. Now we know that that's something that didn't work out and we can look at having something else that they can try out until they really find those, those different things that really are meaningful for them that work best and work well. And, uh, you know, we can make those changes throughout the year. So we will see that um, it's not set in stone. It's not, oh, I have to wait till my next year when we're having the discussion again and reviewing the budget and spending plan. It's, it's like your IPP, right? Your IPP, you don't have to wait till your next meeting with your service coordinator to request the change. Um, same thing with self-determination, um, although I will say that there's there's a little more flexibility in making those changes um, in a way faster, more real time, or leaving things a little more open-ended where you have that flexibility of moving things around and services around to better meet the individual's needs. I'll say my son's plan in his third year was very different from his first year. And the funny thing is, is his third year has less things in it than the first year. I think the first year I was like, we got to do everything. And then we've honed down. And it's like, you know what, this is a good amount of stuff. And really he, this is what he wants to do. And so um, it, it has definitely changed over the years and, and, and will continue to change. Okay. Last question. Cause we're just about to open up the floor to everybody else's questions. So the foundation of self-determination is person-centered. Can you explain why this is so important and how it's different from the traditional model and you know how, how we avoid that parent-centered planning? Um, Melissa. That is a very good question. Um, and when I'm, when I'm working on my person-centered plan, I will say one of my favorite questions is, is especially stealing even with young children um, or, or anyone, but what are, what are your goals for the future? Like, where do you want to live? Who do you want to live with? What do you want, what do you want to do during the day? Um, and. Oops, you muted yourself. There you go. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all I feel like all of those important questions are what informs everything going forward. And so, it knowing that you know the person likes to surf weekly is important when dealing with the regional center and when putting together the person center plan and when putting together the spending plan. And let's say we have to make some tough choices um, about, about money in the spending plan. But knowing that that, you know, that surfing, let's say, once a week is a top priority, that's how we can make decisions. And maybe the surfing isn't such a top priority to the parents, but it is to the client. So it's a good, it's a good question. Hopefully that somewhat answers the question. <laughs> Did anyone else want to tackle that one? I, I will. Um, so, you know, the traditional way of doing things, the medical model, it's a lot of, it's a lot of people talking about you and they're talking about you and what you don't do well or what you need somebody else to, to help or do for you. Um, a person-centered approach is really different. We put the focus person in the middle and we try to take a strengths-based approach and we really take into account the, the things you enjoy and your dislike, how, you know, the kind of person you want to help you, how do you want to be helped, um, right? We start taking into account your preferences. What are the things that, that you prefer um, giving you more control about how you're going to be helped? Um, giving you more control about how maybe you can achieve your goal. 
and really figuring out what interests you. Because at the end of the day, if we work towards things that are, are interesting to us, we're more likely to, you know, expand, improve, whatever it may be in a, in a lot of areas in our life. And you get positive outcomes when it's person-centered, as opposed to sitting there and listening to, um, you know, a group of people talking about how you refuse to, you know, hang your hangers at your work program for the day, or how you don't want to cooperate, you know, taking a shower. Um, it doesn't mean that those aren't things that we can't continue to support you with, but that doesn't become the focus of the conversation. The focus of the conversation is really, you know, who is this focused person? Who are they? What do they enjoy? Who helps them? Um, where do they need more support? And, and it becomes a much more enjoyable process <laughs> and, and you get to lead it, which is really cool. I'll tell you with my sons, you know, I think every mom in this room, uh, so I'm totally guilty of this, will say, oh, I know them better than anybody, which is the worst thing you can say because nobody knows them better than they know themselves. And I think my son was a little concerned that, you know, he might say so he didn't want to offend me or whatever. So luckily we did have somebody else helping and he was able to talk to them and say, hey, these are the things that are important to me without like, you know, think him predicting what he thought I wanted him to say. Um, and so I, I think that's really, really important that that uh, the conversation is with the participants. Um, and you bring up a really good point. It's it's so cool to see families or parents who um, had, a, had an idea. And, and I love it when you've been able to create a space where the, the participant is comfortable enough to start sharing their, their ideas. Um, and, and the parents are going, what? You like Pokemon? You had no idea, you know? Um, what? You want to try surfing? Okay, that's cool. You, there's some fun things that can happen in, when somebody else is there to help help lead it along. And it it doesn't mean or say anything about you as a parent. Um, it just gives an opportunity to to have a have a different kind of conversation. And um, so it actually can kind of be kind of be fun. And and what's really cool is when the the participant is able to start sharing. Yeah, I'd really love to go surfing. And all of a sudden the parents like, oh my gosh, I wanted to surf too. This is something we can, we can start doing together. Right. So it can open doors to actually, um, and, you know, maybe changing the relationship. And so I, that's it. <laughs> Unless they're my kid who is like, going, you're not going with me, mom. <laughs> right. Well, that's another one that shocks parents when, um, when the, when the individual's like, I don't want my mom to help me anymore. I really would like for my mom to just be my mom. And I'd really like to work with, you know, let's say a guy who's close to my age. That's yeah. what I want. And, um, you know, as, as mom, cause I'm a mom. I and mean, when you hear that, you're like, ah, you <laughs> such a good job. You know? Yes, we were. Um, <laughs> right. We've done such a good job that they're now confident enough. They want to go work with somebody else. Um, so that's, that's just the, the fun part of the person center planning process. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. Um, we're just a couple minutes over and I see hands going up already. We have tons of questions in the chat. So um, Valdemitra, you were right on the, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I I'm, I don't know if it's a question or just maybe a statement, well, question, but you know, what if you have a child that doesn't really talk or anything like that? I, I heard what Dustin was saying, but it's like, I'm I'm trying to, you know, get somebody to pull something out of her. She's never mm -hmm. been a talker. She doesn't really say anything. So we're trying to figure out things. And I just don't know, you know, like, like we had a meeting yesterday and the guy was asking her all these things. Well, my daughter has been in this bubble world, it seems like for so long. And so the question that he was trying to pull out of her, she doesn't know anything about, you know, he asked her, you know, he asked her about this and that, and she doesn't know about those things. So how does, how does a person, you know, how do you get a person to do a personal center plan and be able to pull that information out like that? I, I saw Tim unmute. So do you have a, oh no. Um, I will say 
you need to find a person-centered planner who specifically works with people who are non-speaking and they will absolutely know you know, and, and there are so many different ways. I had a, a client who was non-speaking who loved Pinterest and would give, they'd answer their questions by giving me all these Pinterest boards and pictures. Um, and so there's so many ways that people communicate. There's just a million ways that people communicate. So it's, it, it's really important to find somebody who, who is experienced in that. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Can can you not unmute? Oh, can we unmute Val Dimitra? Oh, I was gonna ask. So where where do you find a person? I mean, where do you start to find a person like that? It, remember, we talked about the interviewing the independent facilitators. That, right. I, that would be my first question with them. And if they okay. say, I've never worked with somebody who is non speaking, say thank you and move to the next one. <laughs> okay. You know. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. And it's a great question. It is a really good question. Um, Jenny, go ahead. Hey, um, this has been a really great panel. I am transitioning into SDP and we're really doing the IPP on Friday. So this is like a really perfect right time. My question is, um, I also have a um, sister who I'm advocating for who is semi-verbal, meaning if she's hungry, she can say yes or no. If she's got to go to the bathroom, she can say yes or no. If she's scared, kind of like um, emergency response system, she's able to um, share her needs, but beyond that, more complex things like how is speech therapy going? Um, that's a little difficult. And so what I've been finding is that um, with their current regional center that we've had is they always want to hear it from her and we respect that. But sometimes on occasions, there are times where she may say something blasphemous like, oh, I hate mom or like, I don't know him, which, you know, and it's um, it's a staff member that she's seeing on the weekly or she's just trying to be silly. And so how do we balance that fine line of, hey, we do want her to practice and advocate and state her needs, but at times we have to pull the curtain and we are advocating for her. She's currently not conserved, um, but we are going for a limited conservatorship. We're a little bit late to the game. So that's what's kind of, um, that's been what's difficult, especially around this IPP. She will be present, but I wonder how effective we can be as an advocate family if Regional Center always wants to hear the final say from her, especially around like unmet goals and things like that. Currently, um, she only has one service called respite right now. Does anybody else in the panel want to jump in or? Well, I would, I, my, my first thought would be that would be something good to include on the person center plan. Um, and, you know, just discuss that as 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 one of her, you know, of as, as somewhere on the person center plan, so the regional center um, can understand that. And I'll tell you that, you know, when I start with some people with person center plans um, and their transition age, I may be the first person who who's ever asked them what they wanted or what they wanted to do, uh, and they have no idea. Um, but, you know, we we live in a very medical model world. And if you're in the IEP system, it's a very medical model and, and that's okay. And it's okay if they say things that are not what you would say because they're individuals. Um, and so whatever she has to say is important and is valid. Um, and so it, so don't be worried about them saying something that, you know, I understand what you're saying is, is if you want a certain service, you want her to say a certain thing, but that's kind of just, you know, she is an individual. So she does have those rights um, to to say those things. And, and so I, I, I can't um, emphasize enough. The whole purpose of self-determination is this self-determination piece. And so she should be part of the conversation, but then you can also say, put your part of the conversation in there as well. So I, my encouragement is not to ever silence her, but you can always add your concerns and your pieces in. 
Uh, Dusty, I see you muted. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, Tina um, put in a great comment about needing time to learn about what we want. And, you know, she couldn't have said it any better. And there's no right or wrong way to, to respond to questions or to the planning process. And um, if you get a, a good planner or a good IF, we just take it in stride and we work together and we learn together and we get to know each other together. And it's so typical and it is so common for people to just really struggle to figure out what they want. And that's the whole beauty about self-determination is it's an opportunity for you to, to decide what works for you. So you may have a long list to start off with, or you may have no clue and that's okay. Or anywhere in between, um, you just start where you're at and as you grow, it grows with you. So I hope that answered the question. It's a, it's a tough question. And I know that, and it's a very common question that, that we get. So I have a question from the chat and it was from Susan Halden at um, 451. And she asked, are any of the panel vendorized or applying for vendorization under 099? Um, and for the panelists, how many hours do you typically spend to transition? Is 40 even reasonable? That's a great question. You want to go down the line? Uh, Dusty. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> so I am not vendored uh, for the 099 service. I am contemplating it. Um, my vendoring regional center is one of the more complicated ones that requires millions upon millions upon millions of dollars of insurance. Um, five different million dollar plus insurance policies. So for me, it's it's a little more challenging. Um, I would say typically from start to finish, it's at least 30 hours for me to write the plan and work through a transition. Um, I could see it potentially going up more than that, but it really depends on how much time you spend negotiating budget and how much support you need onboarding with the FMS. Um, so for me, it's about 30 hours, give or take. There are situations where it could be more and there's situations where it could be less. Natalie? I I am vendored. We'll see. <laughs> I did ask my regional center, how do, how do I become unvendored if I don't like this deal right, right off the bat? So um, but I don't, I, I know that there's a need and I want to be able for all clients to be able to experience self-determination. And so we're going to work with the system. Um, and I would agree anywhere between 25 and 40 hours, depending on the client. And then our regional center has added more and more meetings. <laughs> so when you get the newbie um, service coordinator, who's never done this, there's like, five meetings before you get a budget and then there's more meetings. And then now there's, um, now you do your spending plan and they meet and go through a line item. And then there's another meeting. So some of that times increase because of the meetings regional centers requiring. Um, but I always tell my clients, like, I'm going to get you to the finish line with the budget that we have. Like, so if you're if you're working with me and following through and answering my emails and responding and and doing your part, then I'll finish and do my part, even if there's other obstacles. Um, because again, like we talked about, there's a lot of things we don't control in this process, and so just being aware of that. Um, Katie, yeah. So we actually are vendored under 099, um, but as of right now, just for our home regional center, uh, we are not going to offer 099 to all regional centers like we were doing with the 024. Um, so it's gonna be a select few that we try to go through the process with and hopefully not bump into too many obstacles. Uh, one is similar to a dusty shirt. So we'll see what happens there. So as of right now, just one regional center um, is, is where we're at at this point as an agency. And for the hours of support, I'm right there with Natalie and Dusty. It really, I will say 25 
to 40 hours is pretty accurate. It really depends on the individual and what the needs are, language, um, et cetera. So I, I'm right there with that, that same ballpark number. And Melissa. Um, so right now I just put in my application this week for 099 with Westside. And at this point, that will be um, the only um, what, uh, regional center that I'll be servicing clients. Um, and um, I find that Westside takes has a, a few less meetings than other regional centers and, and often um, I only have one IPP meeting, so I would move down the, you know, the estimations with Westside to probably between 15 and 20 hours. Um, other regional centers are much longer, but thankfully Westside um, is a pretty, generally a pretty streamlined process. Uh, and then I'll share, I am 099 with my home regional center. I'm courtesy vendored with two others. When I was under 024, I worked at uh, 14 of the 21 regional centers. That is not going to, I'm not going to be able to do that um, going forward. So that is one of our major concerns about 099 is the independent facilitators limiting um, which regional centers they work with. And I have the same issues with the insurance. There are regional centers, their insurance is just too high. It, I can't justify having one client there and, and spending that much money on insurance. So um, these are our real barriers. Um, and then for the hours, I'm right along with everyone. Somewhere around between 25 to 35 hours is what I usually budget. If I have somebody who um, is uh, uh, non-speaking, um, then sometimes it'll take a little bit longer. So um, I, I'm with you. Um, Tim always gets to go. So I'm, I apologize to everybody who jumps in line, but um, Tim, you had your hand up. I just met with an young adult who is a typer and her mom, and all we talked about with her was burgers, and she and I had a great conversation, and through burgers, she and I had a great conversation about traveling, and her wishes, and etc. As a typer, I refuse to believe that no one can communicate. I've also have people who enjoy to swear, and that is perfectly understandable with me, because even with their cussing, Somehow we understand their hopes and dreams. Please don't think that the person-centered thinking has to be normal. There is no such thing as being normal at all. I love that, Tim. And uh, Tim knows from working with me, I'm not a normal thinker either. So <laughs> that's a great point. Um, uh, Daniel, you're up next. Hey, good evening. Thank you everyone for uh, showing up today. Um, I'm not in the program yet. I've um, been attending most of these meetings for about a year now. I have a son that's 23 year old with Down syndrome who lives with me. Um, so learning a lot about this, um, I'm getting to the point now where I'm understanding the acronyms and <laughs> without having to keep asking, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, although it kind of gets frustrating because almost every meeting something new comes up and there's a new term and a new this uh these numbers and these codes and all that so mm -hmm. kind of behind be, behind i always feel like i'm a step behind um if i have a couple questions uh one uh can you i guess in a nutshell break down the the stages from the initial i know that i need to go to the regional center and do a um a meeting with there or a class to initial for the initial introduction to the program. Um, but in a nutshell, what are the, it sounds like seven or eight steps to finally getting a budget approved and actually getting services started. Um, that would be the first question. And the next question I had was, um, if I understand it correctly, the FMS is the one that pays everybody. I don't pay as the, as the, okay, so that's correct there. So I don't need to worry about payroll or insurance from my side correct all right so i think we can just start with those two questions right right there that's enough for now thank you ladies great questions i'm going to give you the super short nutshell because the first thing that you need to do when you're interested in going into self-determination is to do an orientation so then they're going to go through all the details probably more than you ever wanted to know but 
the very basic process is you start with the orientation, then you are going to do a person-centered plan, then you are going to work on uh, negotiating a budget, you will come up with a spending plan. Along the way, you're going to pick a financial management service you're going to be working with, and then you're going to start planning on getting all of your services up and ready to go, and then you will transition in and start your self-determined life. So that was the the Reader's Digest, which I just dated myself, condensed version of, of what's going to happen. <laughs> um, I have a question in the chat that I thought was interesting because this can be a very controversial question. Um, nobody on the panel is required to answer this because, you know, but the question was, how much do independent facilitators charge per hour? Um, so what I will say is, remember, we have three different positions that we talked about. You're going to start with your person center planner. That there is no set rate, but there's a maximum amount that can be paid, which is $1,000. The self-directed supports, which is that vendored service, that rate is set by DDS, and that is somewhere around $50. It is different at every single regional center, but it's around $50 range. $50 per hour. Per hour, correct. And um, there's a maximum of 40 hours split with the financial management service. And then when you're in self-determination program, remember... You're in a whole nother world now. You're not in a vendor world. So you are going to make a contract with your independent facilitator and you are going to agree on what rate they are going to charge and how many hours they're going to charge, what services they're going to provide. So um, my biggest thing that I typically do is when I work with somebody is we work on their spending plan. I never want them to not be able to get services because of independent facilitator costs. But on the other hand, you will need support very often in the first year to transition the second year until you kind of get to learn to use it. Depending who you are, some people need more individual support all through the year, which we call ongoing supports. So it's really up to you to work and to negotiate and to um, be a good consumer um, when you're hiring this independent facilitator. And my other piece is, remember, you're paying an independent facilitator because they're experts in so many areas. They are experts in generic resources, in self-determination, in the regional center, um, special education. They have all of this massive knowledge, and that's what you're paying for. Make sure when you're doing the other services that they're the correct person for that job. You know, make sure you're not paying an independent facilitator to do something that, you know, like if they're managing staff, that maybe you could have one of your staff manage the other staff. So so it's things to think about like that. Does anybody else have comment? I, I have a very strong opinion about this, clearly. So <laughs> please jump in. <laughs> I, I, I will just sort of add on to what you're saying, Christiana, is that, you know, I also um, have some expertise. So Oh, you just muted yourself. Sorry, I'm on my phone. I keep getting calls as soon as I start talking. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I, um, and so, so you can have multiple independent facilitators or like Christiana, you can have another person help you out. I'm probably not, you probably don't want to pay for me to like, you know, uh, make sure your spending plan is correct and balance your and and calculate your invoices. That's probably not the best use of my time. Um, but maybe interfacing with the regional center and advocating for additional services if needed, that might be a very good use of my time. So um, I that that was just one thing, you know, the expertise and what you want them to do. And you can have multiple people, multiple independent facilitators. Really good point. Does anybody else want to add to that before we? We, we only have five more minutes left. Oh, okay. Uh, Nina has had her hand up. Nina, please go. Thank you for time checking me. <laughs> she needs to be unmuted. Oh, Nina, can can we unmute Nina? Oh, now I'm not. I'm unmuted. Thank you so much. This has been so great, you IFs. It's so great, and um, I got a couple of things. One. 
I don't want to forget, I have to promote the our Self-Advocate Speakers Bureau because that's what Tim wants me to do. And I do everything that Tim tells me to do, I do, including being not normal at all times. So, um, but here's what I want to just, I, I must say this because this the whole conversation, especially around um, the client's communication and parents stepping back and um, the importance of knowing um, the communication styles of the, of the participant, participant to be, that's the phase I'm in now. I, I have the greatest IF, I have the greatest kid. And one of the great things about this process is the, their relationship. Like he, he's he got a quirky communication style. It's completely wacky and great. And, um, but you got to get to know it. And I, you know, it, it it's no good if I'm the translator, I like step back and watch the two of them build a relationship, you know, he didn't want a, a P PCP party meeting, but he, he would, he would be on zoom with his IF like every day if he could. So, but watching that. So what happens in that process is the RIF knows him in from the inside out. And that is like the greatest, it, it's so good on so many levels, but it informs everything about advocating for him. It, it, you know, it infuses everything. And it, it, so I would say any parent who's like, oh, I've got to translate to, and, and, you know, really take the time to back off and let that relationship develop, but also to the IFs, please, like the time, the hours spent so much more worthy spending on developing that relationship than those ridiculous, I'm sorry, there's somebody who I think is pretty great, who's here from my son's regional center, we are still in the transition process and it's hell, hello, but this part of it is the greatest. So I just wanted to shout that out. And now for the Self-Advocate Speakers Bureau, um, please, let me make sure I did. Yes, it's on the website, please. And for IFs, um, maybe make a suggestion for that for your clients because it is, this is like one of the greatest programs ever. Um, it, it just is such, we we we're doing i think we're in the round for our second you know what a cohort or whatever we call it but this is such a great way for self advocates to do skill building on speaking on getting an eventually really learning you know building confidence in doing public speaking in, in all different settings while you know promoting your advocacy goals and so please check it out on the website and i am now done thank you can I jump in just because I think we're going to have to end very soon oh, yes. to say just a couple of things. And we're so sorry we didn't get to all the amazing questions that you had. And I'm going to maybe suggest that we do this topic again at the beginning of the year. Um, so Nina just told you about the Self-Advocate Speakers Bureau. Also in the chat, we are, we are launching the Disability Voices United Ambassador Program. So these are folks who we're going to handpick um, at currently we're going to start it and pilot it at five regional centers and um, we want to encourage those of you who are both family members and self-advocates to apply if you're from one of the our first five regional centers and you will basically help us advocate for more accountability over regional centers as well as the self-determination program so we hope that you'll be interested in being part of this um, and then finally um, I want to let everybody know that our advocacy will continue in 2024. We are hoping to resurrect AB 1147, our Equity and Accountability Act. We are also, drumroll please, introducing legislation to, to um, break down the barriers in the self-determination program. I'm sure we will be talking a lot about it repeatedly to all of you in the new year, and we will ask for your support we may actually need you to go to Sacramento for us um, at certain times, and we will keep you posted. It's not going to solve every problem in the STP, but we're hoping it will solve a bunch of them. So I'm going to turn it back to Christiana to close us out and thank our wonderful guests. I just want to thank our guests. You were so amazing. Thank you all so much. And I want to thank everybody here. We had a, just an amazing year, and it was thanks to all of you. And I want you to have a wonderful, happy holiday season and new year, and we will see you next year. And thank you.